what happened in the 80s was people from outside the movement started to come in and document it. And they decided that it was all going to be hip hop, breakdance, graffiti, was all one big happy family. And that's not my experience at all. Graffiti was around first. If you're doing that shit illegally and taking the public space, that's the true spirit of graffiti. My name is Jason. Uh, I've had a few different names in the course of a, a career which has spanned, I don't know, since 1972. Um, so what are we, almost at 40 years? 2012 will be 40. And we're standing at a very uh, bittersweet place for me because this is where I first hit the trains in 1973. At that point in my career, I was riding Tarantula 235. Uh, which is the street that I actually did live on and grow up on, 235th Street. The neighborhood we're in is called Riverdale, which is uh, the northern part of the Bronx, 242nd Street and Broadway, and behind us is the number one yard, uh, you know, the Broadway line. This line will always mean the most to me because it's where I got my start, and it's where graffiti started, on the outsides of trains. The first guys that I recall hitting this line were guys like Ace 137, uh, Keith 150, Coco 144, Junior and K 161, Turok 161, Frank 207, SJK, Mike 171, those guys. Before it happened on the trains, I, I, I knew of one guy who got up more than anybody else that I, I witnessed, which was Taki 183. Taki 183 was a Greek kid from Washington Heights who was the first guy I recall putting the name and the number together. And the guy was the messenger, I guess, and all city. He had other Greek guys with him, like Phil T. Greek, who I, I vividly remember but wasn't up as much. Then you had guys from the writer's corner, 188, Snake 1, Cola 188, Stitch 1. Those guys were gods to me. Joe 182, Tony 184, Babyface 86. Crushing the Broadway line and the first appearance of graffiti on the outside of a train, anywhere. Guys like Phase 2, who were like the first guys to hit it with a, a select group of guys like El Marco 174 and you know, Taboo, Mo TR, early guys from the Bronx will tell you they first saw the shit, the writing, crude tags on the Broadway line. So, you know, it's an honor for me to have started on the same line where graffiti started. So, you know, I started out before 73 just writing my name in this neighborhood. Yeah, it's the Bronx, but it was a part of the Bronx that was like upper middle class, completely removed from the graffiti scene that was exploding in the city. So I was going around riding my little tarantulas with a little spider around the neighborhood, took over the neighborhood, but nobody saw it. Like nobody in the real mix of graffiti knew I existed, just a few people in my neighborhood. So after a couple of years of doing that, Obviously, I knew that, you know, the big time was the trains, but there was nobody to teach me because my neighborhood didn't have a graffiti scene. I had to figure it all out on my own. You know, obviously, I knew how to shoplift spray paint. I was a little kid looking pretty innocent. That wasn't hard to figure out. But I had to, you know, negotiate this yard. I wasn't the first writer to ever be there. When I went down the hill, I, I could see, like, Cliff 159 and Mafia tags. You know, those were the big time guys. Moses, the king of the line, had already been here. But me and, you know, a couple of my friends that I met along the way from Riverdale eventually made it down the hill, went to the yards, and that was like walking on the moon and planting our flag for us to, to you know, do my little tarantula piece on the one train, follow those trains until I actually saw it run, which I was lucky enough to do. It was like the most amazing thing to me. And I knew even then that my shit was busted. I was a little kid, I was short for my age. I couldn't even reach much above the blue line. My piece was like 
this big if everybody else's was this big. So I really was still a toy, but I felt like I was a bigger toy than I had been before. Then as time went on, by 1974, I grew a little, I was a little older. I figured out where to get unis and minis. Uh, I met some other people. Um, I was trying to move up in the game and other people were getting older. This was our spot. Nobody really came here because the other end of the one train, which was on 137th to 145th and Broadway, was a much bigger space underground tunnel where people from Harlem and Manhattan had an easier time getting to and could, you know, do more damage. It just was bigger. There's like 14 lanes here of trains, which is really plenty for, for me and my friends. And, uh, you know, this was our spot. You know, people weren't coming up here, um, you know, as white kids, we didn't stand out like something was out of the ordinary. Um, there were guys that, that uh, adjoining here is a soccer field called Gaelic Park, which still exists. It was like Irish soccer games would be going on while we would be hitting the yard. Old Irish guys would be like, get the fuck out of here. What the fuck are you doing? You know, and it, it was like, you know, you had to negotiate different shit. It was it was like we had to we had to stand on top of the hill and monitor when the workers, when the yard was most active, figure out the schedule. There was a lot, of, it was like being on a stakeout. So we figured it out and eventually, you know, I came out with the name in 74, Terror 161. By 74, there were like 10,000 people in the city writing graffiti. There was like a million snakes by then, a million saints. Um, it was very hard to think of a cool name that somebody hadn't had already. So I was in history class, you know, we're going over France, they had the reign of terror, and it just hit me like, terror, that's a dope name, nobody has that shit. I took 161 from Junior and K 161, who were the all-time kings in the tagging, single hit era, as, as people like Comet would, would call it, when there was just signatures and nothing else. Um, and within another year, I had like a whole group of guys around me we formed a crew called The Mob, the Masters of Broadway, abbreviated The Mob. I thought that was brilliant at the time. I still think it's a very dope name. And as we grew, we started to dominate the one line. By the time, like from 75 to 77 were our peak years. We had a guy named Use 2 who was definitely king of the outsides on Broadway, 77 into 78, but by that time, in 1976, I had some drug issues. Uh, I was out of the scene. Uh, I came to grips with that and didn't write graffiti again till 1980. When I met my partner of that era, when I came back, who just happened to work in the supermarket I was working in, a kid named Ammo, who I wrote with in the you know early 70s, and we kind of just like fucked around as a goof one night, you know, drunk on on Budweisers came over here, rode a little on top of the yard, didn't even go in, and then it just dawned on us, like, now we're in our 20s, we drive cars, nobody thinks of a graffiti writer being a man. How easy would it be to, you know, pick up where we left off and, and just start all over again? So, at that point, I changed my name for the final time to Jason, J-S-O-N, which was inspired by this guy, Peanut 2, who was like one of Tracy's most significant uh, partners. For me, Tracy 168 was the dopest writer of the, of the 70s, did it all, uh, you know, everybody was talking about him. He was able to draw better than anybody else. He had fighting stories, stealing stories. Everybody was talking about this guy and he was killing every line you know, I mean, he was from the four line, but he had shit on the fives, the twos, went out to sevens. I mean, the guy was, was legendary in what he did. So his partner, Peanut, P.Nut, abbreviated, J.S.O.N, part of my name. That's, that's where I got that from. When I came back in the 80s, not, I didn't have to um, walk on foot to paint stores. I no longer had to be home by 11. I had a car, I could go to any layup or yard in the Bronx. 
and meet other people. And nobody suspected me of stealing because like grown man stealing paint, that doesn't happen. So it just made that simple. Um, luckily for me, I wound up partnering up with some of the most notorious and creative people in the 80s, mainly CAP, MPC, and SCENE, um, who you could say were on opposite ends of, of the graffiti spectrum. People don't know what I look like until now, until I start going to the movies, they're gonna see my face, big deal. If anybody tries to screw around with me and my friends, I go over everything they got forever. Everybody from Brooklyn and Manhattan. Everybody. That's the way it is. Especially with, especially with me, the object is more. Not the biggest and the beautifulest, but more. Cap showed me a lot of stuff, other parts of the Bronx, scene helped my career greatly. Obviously, he was the more talented of our partnership and, you know, uh, was one of those guys who made everybody around him look good just by association. There are a lot of guys in the history of graffiti like that. Mainly, they had their own crews. For UA, you know, not to say there weren't other talented guys, but scene's shadow loomed largest, just like Tracy did with Wild Style and Wanted. Um, so I got to write with guys like T-Kid, Cope, uh, you know, Zephyr, well, not that much with him, but one thing that started my comeback was I started in 79 and 80 to notice the first incarnation of uh, RTW, which were mainly uh, Revolt, Rasta, Mackey, Bill Rock, um, Zephyr, um, Crunch, couple of guys, but they had this real hippie style that looked like they all were like tripping on acid 24 hours a day. I'm a guy that grew up doing a lot of drugs, LSD, hallucinogenics, listening to the Grateful Dead, Led Zeppelin. There was no such thing as hip hop and graffiti for me. Like graffiti was one thing, hip hop was another. So when I saw these guys doing this hippie tripped out shit, it was really inspiring to me. Um, Zephyr had a beautiful hand style, Revolt, all these guys were killing the insides of Broadway. Then a guy from the past comes out of nowhere, Futura 2000, starts hitting the insides. He had, see this is one thing in the 80s that people almost forgot about with a few, few major exceptions, Zephyr being one. There was a real emphasis on the artwork on the outside of the train. People could burn like never before. You had guys like Knock doing Style Wars, Dondi doing Children of the Grave. Um, so many good people. But what was missing was emphasis on tag style. A lot of people that could do burners could not write their names elegantly like it was in the 70s. Also what disappeared was all any semblance of respect on the insides. It just became a huge land grab and people were just taking black flooded markers and going over everybody till all you saw was a sea of black drips on the insides. Back in my day you would see this, Voice of the Ghetto, and it was like a picture frame on the corner of the card. The dude, Stay High, would take the ad down, have a clean slate, and just put that tag there with a uni and two different colors in the same marker. Guy was a fucking genius, man. And, and, and that, that to me was like more exciting than 99% of the burners in the 80s. Seeing those tags, Jester One, um, you know, amazing. Had like three different tag styles that were all amazing. Um, that in the 80s disappeared. Zephyr was one of the few guys that really had an amazing tag style that no matter where you looked at it in the subway car, it stood out. Scheme was another guy who had an amazing hand style um, in the 80s. There were, there were a few, but what happened in the 80s was people from outside the movement started to come in and document it. And they decided that it was all going to be hip hop, break dance, graffiti, it was all one big happy family. And that's not my experience at all. Graffiti was around first, Break dancers are talented in their own field. Rappers in their own field, they're all separate things, okay? 
Graffiti, I think, is, is minimized by lumping it in with another movement when it's its own movement. I mean, like, you know, I don't know of any paintings by Rembrandt that are like, oh, well, Rembrandt was listening to Beethoven, so really, he's part of, like, the classical music movement. That's, re that's ridiculous to me. Guys like Stay High, you know, Phase Two will tell you, and these guys really are, you know, they lived hip hop. They'll tell you graffiti came first and that it's a separate issue. But in the 80s, and this is important because most people in Europe got the culture from Style Wars, Subway Art, Wild Style, Beat Street, and it was packaged for them, and they had a blueprint that they followed. And so really what happened was, you know, life imitated art in the sense like, okay, we're gonna get, like, here's our manual. Now, if we really wanna be a graffiti writer, we have to subscribe to a whole lifestyle, which was assigned to an art form, which is not what I experienced. And for some people, that experience is true. But in the history of hip hop, where guys really ascended to like the royalty of hip hop, there were a few guys that really lived hip hop royalty and graffiti royalty. The guys that come out to me as those guys are Doze and Dez, who became like, you know, major, major force in hip hop. But guys that were like part of breaking crews that made a major impact on graffiti, very few and far between. I don't know what the hell you were doing in my crib, but I want this shit out of my room. What you mean shit? Stop fucking around and be a man. I would say like whatever music, you know, I think Dick Clark, the American bandstand dude said, everybody's life comes with its own soundtrack. Okay, for maybe the guys writing in the 80s, a lot of their soundtrack of their lives were hip hop. Great, that's irrelevant to what appeared on the train, which was a visual thing. We were looking at other people's styles, biting it. Sure, some of the characters uh, were hip hop b-boy characters, which was a reflection of, you know, what they were listening to. Before that, you had a guy on the seven line who was way ahead of his time, Kane. This guy was doing characters that were way advanced. One of the most iconic ones was an Alice Cooper top to bottom, said welcome to hell, and another top to bottom skull in a cloak uh, figure on the other side. That was, you know, this guy was going around, um, you know, worshiping the devil and, you know, listening to rock music that, you know, there was a guy who wrote Chicago in the 70s from the MG Boys, just like the group Chicago on the albums from the group by that same name. I'm not saying that graffiti's rock and roll, but just like black, white, all kinds, what, I, what attracted me to it was, it was a sport that everybody could get down with and be unified by. So by saying it's a part of one specific music, I don't buy it. I, I don't think music has anything to do with it. It's, it's an art form. And um, so getting back to my own career, in the 80s, one thing that happened which escalated to a, a level that never was before in the history of graffiti was the level of violence because you had the crack epidemic coming out in 82 and people that were like, you know, on that shit, were like ready to, you know, do anything to get it. Angel Dust was big. There was a level of violence in the streets that spilled over into the trains. You had a crew called the Ball Busters, which a lot of them didn't even write, but they were fierce, you know, involved in, in the drug trade right above the one tunnel. And they used to go down into the one tunnel and just look to rob people for their paint. And they, you know, they had weapons. And, you know, I don't care how tough you were or how many people you had, they had, they were better armed and there were more of them. So there were levels of obstacles that you had to, you know, you had to know where you were going. You had to have a great support network behind you in terms of having your own backup in order just to get up. Um, so really to, to do something 
with no uh, monetary payout and, and risk your life and, you know, dedicate so much because like when you're a graffiti writer, you are giving up opportunities in your life, whether it's going to college or, you know, having a nice girlfriend. You know, it's hard, like, I don't care what people say, girls do not like guys that write graffiti. You're dirty all the time. By the time I was doing it, it's like, you're 25. What the hell are you still doing that kid shit for? I just loved it, you know? It was, it was, it was like being uh, in the Foreign Legion uh, and having adventures every day. You were communicating uh, with, with people in Brooklyn, uh, whether it was going over them or like somebody telling you through the grapevine, like, yo, I saw that whole car you guys did. That was amazing. Um, it, was, it was a visual communication network before the internet existed. The internet made everything easy. Now you can see anything done anywhere in the world the day it's done by, by going on a computer screen. We, you know, I mean, we had to negotiate barbed wire. We had to, uh, you know, I mean, I, 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 I got 26 stitches in my hand, 10 in my head, and I still went back. And I wasn't getting money for this shit. It was all some kind of imaginary concept that we knew who each other were and we thought we were famous. Now, 38 years later, I look down in this yard, I don't recognize these trains, which have no graffiti on them whatsoever. There's almost no sign of anything written. This was the hot spot. Everybody had their tags, KT3, Chrome 100, FDT 56. Anybody who ever ventured up here had their name on one of these walls or the metal fence on the other side. Now, it's like the whole scene never existed. And that to me is, is, is sad because you know, it makes you see, you, you feel like you wasted your time and that you never existed. But hopefully like enough documentation exists and people like me and from my era will, you know, from, from a bird's eye view of actual participants in the movement that lived it, will tell you what it was like. Um, and, and um, you know, I, start, I started in 73 on the trains and I probably hit my last train in 1989, but that was only because I wanted to get my name on one of these trains, which I did. But, you know, at that time, you had the clean train movement and there were dedicated guys that were just hitting the clean trains in the hopes of keeping graffiti alive, which was a losing battle in the end. But the fact that they were dedicated to doing it, I give them a lot of credit because the risk far outweighed the reward. I got my name on a train. I photographed it on one of these new trains. The train ran to some scrubbing station. Nobody ever saw it. For me, that was the end. The point of writing graffiti was to be known, to have your name riding across that elevation in big letters, and people in Brooklyn, Bronx, Manhattan, wherever they that wherever there was a scene, would know your name. You know whether whether they hated you, liked you, they they knew your name, and if if they did know your name, you had succeeded. You know maybe you weren't a style master, maybe you were a throw-up king. Whatever your level of creativity or output, you had a place and a role, and it was it was like a family. Sometimes you don't get along with your third cousin and want to kill him, but it was like a family and it was a special thing. So I feel like people that do walls now are way better than what we were doing uh, back then, but the framework of where they're putting it will never be as exciting as a moving piece of steel that you know you would eagerly await on a station for the, like, oh, I heard Dondi did something on the one line. Oh, Knock did some amazing whole car with, uh, you know, Days and Med. We got to get pictures of that. Or being able to call up a Henry or Martha Cooper and being like, yo, Henry, uh, be on the, the, the daytime side of 180th Street tomorrow. Me and so-and-so just did a whole car. You got to get flicks of this. And this guy who came from a totally different background with his camera, was on that station documenting what would become an important part of a culture that's now a dead culture. So 
Yeah, I love to see what people can do today and doing this book that will be out in October, Graffiti 365, I got a chance to submerge myself in the old and the new and in street art, which is a whole different ball game, which I've lived long enough to now say has kind of surpassed us in terms of what the public's perception of graffiti is. I don't relate so much to wheat pastes and stencils and image versus letter-based art, but it's here and there are good guys and bad guys, the same that, that were in graffiti. And unlike what we did, there's more of a, 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 an impetus to try and move towards a gallery and a payout because you have guys like Banksy and Barry McGee that have shown the way to getting a big t payday through first breaking big on the street and then having some gallerists champion your cause and you know put you in the limelight and and give you a career I mean you have to have the talent to do it but you know that's where people people aren't focused now on being the king of the street as much or the king of the trains which don't exist they're they're looking at like being millionaires and I think that's a good thing because it validates that the the art world is accepting us even though the street art people aren't us the graffiti people but in a way the graffiti uh, era was more special to me because there was no uh, ulterior motive other than to just you know be the biggest and baddest cat on the block and 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 get some kind of fame where there was no paycheck attached it was just for love of you know the adventure or the art depending on on what your skill set was and and that's gone as you could see you know this this yard is you know all new york city there's not one piece on the train anymore and uh you know not even a tag on a rock which is is you know just sad to me but you know, I, I think what has to happen is that probably 50 years after all the graffiti people who hit trains are dead, people might catch on that it was a folkloric period in New York, which spurred on so much of what came after, including street art, that the people that actually hit the trains will be collected and paid big money for at auction uh, at a level that certainly doesn't exist now. And, you know, that kind of commercial validation is not necessary, but it would be very uh, validating in the terms of somebody appreciating that, like, we were an important part of history and people are willing to pay for that. It's happening to a very small degree now, but in the art world, I think really a, a dead body is needed by, you know, from the artists to really, like, make their stuff valuable, so. We'll see what happens, you know. I know I'm holding on to all of my old stuff, so, you know, we'll see. Um, but just getting back to my own career, by 1984, I was going to, like, the last stage of my career, uh, I started to go to the Ghost Yard with T-Kid and, uh, you know, Mac and Bio and those guys a bit. And uh, even then, I was getting older, I had just gotten a job and, you know, it didn't feel right to be that old and writing graffiti and I felt like my best years were already behind me. So I quit, only to come back, like I said, and hit one clean train in 1989 and, you know, I, I, like I said in, a, in another film, um, I felt there was nowhere for me to take it, you know, artistically. Uh, prolifically, I had done everything I could possibly set out to do with the, the, with the tools I had to work with and you know I, I was fully satisfied. After that I began to write about my experiences and try to document the movement as best I could um, because I feel like the movement has largely been docu documented by people who never really understood it and just uh, wrote about it anyway, and there's very little coming from inside the movement to document it by people who actually experienced it. So, you know, when I'm gone, at least somebody will have 
a document to, you know, coming from the horse's mouth instead of somebody who spoke to somebody who took a picture and, you know, wrote their own caption that didn't really understand it. So it's very powerful, you know, motivation for me to try and put a different spin on the culture than the status quo book version that's out there. So, you know, my book will not try to rewrite history, but it'll give you a full perspective of, you know, what I feel was important throughout the movement, which isn't what every other book has. But, you know, I'm just one person. That doesn't mean I have all the answers either. As I see it now, um, I feel that it's become uh, refined artistically to such a high degree that it's almost impossible to discern where graffiti ends and fine art begins. I mean, you have people that can draw. There's a kid, Owen Dippy, from New Zealand, who draws like these gigantic portrait realistic of hip hop and, and, and music people that are amazing, like black and white with a spray can. That guy, uh, L. Mack from California, who's down with like Seventh Letter Crew. Another portrait guy that's, that's incredible. What people could do with spray cans today and the, the, the fact that, you know, European companies, you know, make this paint with like 50,000 different levels of, of grades of fat caps that you could go from a hair line to something this wide. Um, it makes it easier and the internet gives everybody such a wide array of styles to copy and computer assisted drawing programs that I, I miss that. I miss the like, the, the, the part of graffiti where it was just tacky 183, no computers, you had to figure it out all on your own. And I know I'm sounding like a guy that's like, when I was a kid, we had a ride to school on horseback or walk through the snow five miles. We didn't have cars, you know, there was no air conditioning. We had a block of ice in, inside the apartment. But I'm old and that's what I know. And, you know, unlike a lot of people though, as far as street art and graffiti, there's a huge disconnect where a lot of us, and I used to be one, feel like, yo, that, you know, that, that art school, you know, stuff, I'm not feeling that. Yo, what, what is like, uh, you know, putting up a sticker or a stencil or a wheat paste? Where's the risk in that? You do all this, the artwork in the safety of a studio and then just slap something up. And even if they catch you, they don't look at it as a serious crime like spray paint is. There's truth to that. But also, nothing is forever. A lot of these kids are talented and do get busted or hurt. And you know, you got guys taking out whole sides of buildings now with fire extinguishers loaded with paint. That's pretty, you know, that's, that's a powerful tool. And believe me, that's, you know, you have acid etch, which takes out a whole glass window, ruining it. You know, the train, if, that, if you hit the train with that, that's it, game over, they cannot Right, they cannot buff you. They have to replace the window. And since they've taken everything else away, the trains, the outsides, you know, I think that's destructive, but what do they expect? You know, it's like a cockroach is the only thing left after a nuclear explosion. Those acid etch tags are the cockroaches of graph. I mean, you can't, you can't kill them, you know? And fire extinguishers, all the stuff that's like, okay, you've taken this away from us, we're gonna come up with a counterattack weapon that you're not gonna be able to eradicate so easily. And that's, a lot of those weapons eliminate style from the game, but who cares? I mean, just the fact that graffiti exists illegally, which is the pure spirit in my, in my mind, whether it's a street art stencil, if you're doing that shit illegally and taking the public space, that's the true spirit of graffiti, a permission wall may be pretty and, 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 and highlight high degree of talent. But when a guy like, there's these two kids, PK and Kid, they're like everywhere on the New Jersey Turnpike, on water towers, climbing up, risking their lives. That to me, like a guy like Revoke in California, taking you know his life into his hands, hanging from death-defying situations, JA1, 
you know, been at it for like 25 years. Every truck you see in, in, in the city, this guy's got his name on it still. A guy like that with nothing to prove. Just, you know, I want to get over. I want to like say I'm not accepting the legitimized version of graffiti that, you know, most people do accept. I have the true spirit of graffiti. I'm out there doing shit without your permission. That's what I love, you know. And what else I love? The point in graffiti which does not exist anymore, which was when you saw the name and wondered who was writing it. The mystery. Like, I don't know who that guy is. I know he's famous. I, know, I never met Taki 183 or Stay High. I knew they were famous. They were my idols. You know, I never met Tracy back in the day. But I knew that they were famous and I kind of liked the fact that I never, they were out of my reach and they were a mystery. That mystique doesn't exist anymore. And you know, maybe Banksy to a certain degree. I mean, I know people know who he is, but he's kind of like, at least from a, a large degree of what the public knows, captured that, you know, mystique essence of what's important in, in, in graffiti, like being you know, uh, an under the radar superstar that nobody knows. That's kind of like in the 80s when, uh, you know, guys started to uh, get love from the galleries and go to Europe and hang out with The Clash and, you know, do videos with, with rap stars. It was great for them because they were able to cash in on a talent that they had. But the sad part of it was now everybody knew who the face was connected to the name and that mystique was forever compromised. So, you know, maybe I'm romanticizing it, nothing is forever, but that when, when graffiti went mainstream, it kind of took away a little bit of, of the spirit of what attracted me to it in, in its onset. <laughs>